Today, I'm joined by Jim Holland, a former Navy weapons engineer. Jim has traveled the world before leaving and becoming a publican in Barnsley, then entering the corporate world and having an outstanding career before starting his own company, Karma, which is making a real positive impact in the world that we all live in. Hi, Jim. Thanks very much for coming on today. Nice to have you. Absolutely. My pleasure, Nick. Delighted to be here in central London on a sunny summer's day. <laughs> so let's start the story at, at the beginning. So young Jim wants to join the Navy. So uh, what, what happened there? I didn't always want to join the Navy. I suppose it'd been burning in the back of my mind from the tales my grandfather used to regale of being in the Second World War. Now, he spent 55 years down the mine and professed to the day he died that the best time he spent in his life was being at war and not in the mine. Travelled the world, opened his eyes, sampled different cultures, and he used to say, if I died tomorrow, I've done four times as much as I ever thought I would do when I first went down the pit. So that was kind of played on my mind, and I thought, do you know what? This could be for me, and especially the lack of opportunities in Barnsley in the early 80s led me to thinking this could be a good career move. What did you join us? So I joined up as a weapons engineer mechanic. I, I went to take the artificers exam because I did terrible at school. I was the guinea pig for GCSEs. So all of a sudden, all levels used to be able to turn up on the day, take an exam and pass them. GCSEs, the shift of the goalposts, you had to do a lot of coursework. And let's just say that homework wasn't my forte. So I got three really poor GCSEs. I took the artificers entrance exam. Somehow managed to fail that and joined up as a weapons engineer. Okay, so then you went into uh, basic training, trade training. Uh, how did you find that? This is like your first sample of military life. It was wonderful. Structure. So 2nd of October 1989, I walked through the gates at HMS Rally um, with a lot of like-minded, bewildered individuals. And then six weeks, six to eight weeks actually, of um, non-stop intense training. And, and it was just great to have that structure, being with like-minded people, lots of fizz, Really, really enjoyed it. And, and to my delight, at week four, I got paid. I wasn't <laughs> expecting that. <laughs> £474, and it, it was like Christmas. I thought, this is going to happen every month. How good is that? I actually had my 18th birthday party in the second, no, the first week, 6th of October. Um, while I was in basic training, the guys all chipped in and got me a tracksuit. Uh, yeah, nice. Yeah, <laughs> happy days. I'd like to say I'd still got it, but I haven't. <laughs> So then you you moved your way through training. Where, where was your first uh, first post after after training? So training took us about eight, nine months to be a fully qualified weapons engineer. I then joined HMS Manchester, which was just gearing up to go to the first Gulf War. Oh. So, uh, yeah, I wasn't expecting that. So within being in the Navy for 18 months, I was on a Type 42 destroyer, steaming my way fast passage through the Mediterranean, to, to the first Gulf War, and, and of course, it was a, it was there's a lot of unknowns with uh, the first Gulf War. Nobody knew exactly the capability of the Iraq forces and whether they were going to deploy chemical weapons. So you can imagine the amount of MBCD training that we were doing, sleeping in overalls, gas mask available at all times. So it was quite a thrilling thrilling experience for a young man i was i was 19 at the time and I, on reflection looking back i was so excited we had a wonderful captain uh, commander Forsyth, and i'll never forget the announcement he made when we were going through the red sea he said i can't wait to get through the red sea get round the corner and get some lead in the air and i thought <laughs> what a winner um and i, I always reflect on it and, and look at think of the, the people who were a little bit more senior and uh, non-commissioned um, ratings and um, I can remember looking into their eyes and and thinking what we're going into here but as young lads we, we were a little bit more gung-ho just hungry for it yeah very hungry but you spend all that time training and then it you know the norm is that you then spend years not doing it and just do more and more practicing but then sometimes you finish training and it's right pack your kit up we're off yeah brilliant yeah. really really exciting our helicopter saw more action than the ship we we would um, in defence watchers for two months, and we were air defence for um, USS Princetown and Tripoli. And one day they both hit mines, and we were supposed to be in a swept channel. The minesweepers had gone before us. 
giving us the assurance that there were no mines in the area. Then all of a sudden, both the ships hit mines. Yeah, it was, it was quite tense. Yeah, I can imagine. So then, uh, how long did you spend out there? We were in theatre for six to eight weeks. Um, the war finished pretty rapidly. We were the first ship alongside in Kuwait, which was an experience. There were some fantastic photographs of that. The Iraqi army had ransacked everything. There wasn't anything that was serviceable when they'd left and in the dockyard. And trust me, we looked <laughs> <laughs> for some gizits. And uh, yeah, it was brilliant. It, 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 it was a real eye-opening experience. Um, when then went to Dubai and then for a bit of R&R &R over the Indian Ocean and then um, straight to Penang, Malaysia and Singapore. Wow. What a place to be when you're 19. Yeah, I've been to Penang. It's beautiful. Yeah, it is. It is. You can go around the island in about two and a half hours, can't Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not very big, yeah. Or 40 minutes if you've got a ball pad and you're, and you're racing. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, yeah, the, clocking up some travel really early on in the career. That, yeah. was, uh, that must have been good fun. Oh, exhilarating. Absolutely. I, couldn't, I used to have to pinch myself. Places like Tiananmen Island, we're out in the South China Sea, and it was just really wonderful. We got some station leaving Penang and um, went up to Hat Chai in southern Thailand on a recce. That, that was interesting with um, a, a friend of mine. He was the um, PTI on board, corporal in the Royal Marines, Gary Bullen, and it, it, we had a real adventure up there, sampling different cultures. I don't know how it works in the Navy. Is it a bit like the Army where like, you you keep getting fresh postings or do you join a ship and stay with that one? A bit like the Army. So every 18 months, two and a half years, you get a fresh posting. I'd qualified while I'd been away from, from my next rank, leading hand. So I, I, I got promoted and then moved off and went on my leading hands course. Uh, another year in training. Then uh, back up to Northwood. We had an 18-month posting at Northwood down the bunker in the crypto cell. We got quite a thorough DV, which was a, it was a joy. A foreign captain came to see me with a file that that thick, a foot and a half thick on me. I'm thinking, well, I'm only 21. What does he know? And he, and he said, Are you going to tell me about your Ladbrokes account, or shall I tell you? <laughs> and uh, yeah, re really great conversation. And of course, I'd omitted to tell all the people I'd put as referees in Barnsley that I was being vetted. So one of the people was my pub landlord, and he rang me up quite irate one day and said. Um, the next time you do that, he said, I've just eaten 15 VAT receipts. As this guy has been walking up my garden path. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> so then, uh, 18 months being back in the UK, not traveling around, did, did you still enjoy that as much? We still had a purpose, you know, working with some really interesting stuff, a lot, a lot of good engineering down at Northwood, engineering comm circuits. Um, but then I, I got posted to HMS Northumberland for a two and a half year draft. That, that was amazing. It was the best ship I ever served on. At that time, I, I was a leading weapons engineer mechanic. I had the radar section. Um, so, yeah, make sure the radars were operational all the times. But of course, when you're at sea, the radars are working because that's how the, the navigating officer and the captain navigate the ship. Of course, if the radars are working, there's not a lot of maintenance you can do. I had quite a lot of downtime that I spent in the gym or doing circuits, getting fit. And yeah, I really enjoyed that ship. It's the best ship I ever served on. What makes you say that? Um, it was quite a compassionate crew. I had a great captain, Steve Bramley, who's a delight to serve underneath. I was the leading hand of the mess, one of the biggest mess decks. So I, and I've got a lot of autonomy. I was a, an expert in my field, played rugby, for the ship's rugby team. Some great trips. Where do you play rugby on a ship? Ah, well, you don't play on the ship. <laughs> Every time the ship goes into port, they uh, organise you a rugby game. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's brilliant. We played all over the place. Bahamas, Falkland Islands. Played. Up in the Falklands? Yeah, yeah, we went down the Falkland Islands. What a great trip that was, the Falkland Islands. We uh, had a seven-month deployment. After leaving Plymouth, within four days, we were at Tenerife. Had a good week at Tenerife and transit of the Atlantic, stopped off at Ascension, went down the Falkland Islands, um, started our patrol there, did a handover. And of course, our ship, Northumberland, was a brand new Type 23 frigate, and it had a bow dome on the front. And uh, I can remember one day the sonar maintainer came up and he said, we've got water coming in the bow dome. 
and it wasn't a lot of water, but when you're in the middle of the Atlantic, any water coming in that's unexpected raises a few eyebrows. So you can imagine it was treated with the utmost priority. Everyone looked at it and they determined that we needed to go into a dry dock. And I'll never forget the pipe the captain made. He said, guys, unfortunately, we're leaking water. It's not a lot, so there's no imminent danger. However, we are going to have to go into a dry dock. Unfortunately for us, the only one that can take us with, within reason is in Rio de Janeiro. So we're going to be there for six weeks. <laughs> and Nick, it was the best six weeks of my life. <laughs> I've been back to Rio three times since. Wow. Such a great It didn't place. happen to be carnival season, did it? It didn't. Unfortunately, <laughs> we missed out on carnival. But however, um, Fluminense won the league that year. We was there. And, and the game they played to win it, we all managed to get tickets and went in the American Arts. 200,000 people. It's just a, an endearing memory. It was just a great time. So was that on the way to the Falklands that you had to have six weeks in Rio? It, we were down there on station. We got called back up to Rio. Then we went back down, had a month in the Falklands. Then we came back through um, the Magellan Straits at the bottom of Chile and transited the Pacific Ocean on the west coast of South America. So we stopped in Chile, which, again, being the radar maintainer, one of my jobs when the ship came alongside was to, to store the radar to make sure the radar was put away and ready should we need to sail quickly. So I was always the last off the ship. And my run ashore up was they'd always wait for me at, at the gangway, probably about 15 to minutes to half an hour after everyone else has already gone. And we're in this town, quite remote Arica in Chile, and walking into the, the town centre, excited, looking for somewhere to have a beer. And then all of a sudden we heard all this Patagonian panpipe music. And a massive crowd of the mass in the town centre. We're like, wow, this looks this looks excellent. Let, let's go and get involved. So we pushed our way to the front. There's all these guys that sat there with Mexican hats on, ponchos, pan pipes, doing this gig. Everyone's clapping and cheering. There were guys off the ship. <laughs> <laughs> They'd gone ashore, bought the gear, and was putting on a show. <laughs> Just like absolutely brilliant. Hilarious. Yeah. So two and a half years on. Northumberland. Two and a half years on, on Northumberland. Left and, and went back to HMS Collingwood where we did our training. I'd been selected to be a weapons engineering artificer. I um, was playing a lot of rugby at the time. Joined Collingwood. Then it was a four-year course. It was a full apprenticeship. Oh, wow. So it was brilliant. So a chance to get fit, play a lot of rugby. I ran Brickwood's field gun four times while I was there, which was really exciting. At this point in my life, I was ready to apply myself to academia. So I, was, I got quite studious yeah. for a few years. Absolutely aced the course, played a lot of rugby. I started playing rugby league for the Royal Navy. Did you play the Army-Navy game? I played against the RAF. I never played it. I never played. Didn't play the big one. No, no. <laughs> it's, it was rugby league, not union. So it, oh, okay. it wasn't it wasn't Twickenham. I was better at rugby league for one reason. I didn't have to pass the ball. So people used to throw <laughs> the ball. I had to catch it, of course. But then I just used to be able to take contact run through people and I was quite adept at doing that <laughs> and I loved it and I, my, my strongest suit in rugby was tackling I was always good at tackling got the build for it yeah I'd take after my mum I've got my mum's <laughs> build <laughs> so uh, you, you do your four years at Collingwood the four years at Collingwood um, I got posted to HMS Marlborough prior to joining HMS Marlborough it was a, a minesweeper I'd um, picked up an injury playing rugby league, took a, took a bad tackle um, and really hurt my back. So I was so, um, medically downgraded for 18 months to two years. I used that time wisely. I went to Portsmouth University and took my HND up to a, to a degree in computing. So I applied myself to that. I was trying to get fit and I, I timed out. And because I couldn't get fit, I couldn't go back to sea, couldn't get promoted. And because I couldn't get promoted, I was no longer required, so I was medically discharged at the tender age of 30. Wow. Yeah, that was a blow, real blow. And um, I'd sort of settled on the south coast. I got a nice house down there. And um, I, I always say the best decision I ever made was leaving Barnsley and joining the Royal Navy. The worst decision I ever made was going back <laughs> when I left the Royal Navy because I'd moved on significantly. I'd got three O-levels when I left. No life experience, no people experience. Of course, went back to Barnsley with a degree in computing, a HND in electronic engineering. 
loads of good stories, loads of a wealth of management and people experience and world experience. And Barnsley hadn't moved on one bit. And I, and I, I really struggled. I'm thinking, I've got no job lined up. So I bought a town centre pub. I'd got loads of money in the bank. And I thought, right, what am I going to do? So I bought this pub. It was a going concern. It, four DJs, six doormen, 22 bar staff. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, it was yeah, a funky house pub. Some some serious money passing hands. 20 grand a week turnover. Bez from the Happy Mondays was a frequent visitor. He was over for a couple of times doing gigs and DJing for us. One of the DJs who was there now. He's now a world famous DJ a guy called Daily Paddley, hot since '82. Tours with Pete Tong and things like that. It was brilliant. It was, it was a great party scene. And the first year we, we made a few quid, but year two, the leisure pound really dipped. The bands we sold took a turn for the worst, and, and he started costing me a lot of money. To the point I had to pull the pin. In total, it probably cost me 180,000 pounds. So yeah, I managed to get out just by the skin of my teeth. But there was there was still no opportunity for me. I learned, but I'd learned so many lessons running the pub. It, it was one of the harshest. What do you think the pub taught you? Oh, just a lesson in economics. You know, when when you're running a, an, any business, it, it's all on you. But turnover, you know, the old saying, turnover is vanity, profit is sanity. Yeah, and it, it's all about the bottom line and managing the bottom line. Nothing else. Doesn't matter if you've had. Five people or 5,000 people through your doors. How much money are you really making? Yeah. But I've got to say, Nick, I had a great time. <laughs> it, it, was yeah, fa- yeah. It, it was fantastic. But, but harshly, I would have been, it would have been cheaper going to the London School of Economics for 18 months or so. And I could have lived quite, a good, <laughs> quite, quite an affluent <laughs> lifestyle doing so. You've got to get everything right when you're running a small business. And, and I hadn't got enough business experience at, at that time to, to manage the bottom line. Yeah. Hopefully we're, we're putting that right now though. And it's funny because we sold the pub and I really struggled to find a job. There's no real industry up there, particularly doing what I was doing. What were you looking for? Um, so computer, IT. My degree was in computing and I hadn't realised how much I was missing the Navy. And it's funny because when you leave the forces, you lose three things overnight and you don't realise that for some, some time, but you lose your forces family your purpose and your identity. And and I hadn't come to terms with that and I hadn't made peace with that. After about four years, I, I was at the point where I, I couldn't keep up my mortgage payments, thinking, what am I going to do here? And I, I got a phone call from a friend, Steve McCann. He was at Vodafone. He said, how are you getting on, Dutch? I'm like, mate, I'm struggling. I'm really struggling. He said, well, he said, my boss is taking on. He said, we're a team of Unix engineers. He said, send me a CV. I'll send him it. He'll probably give you a call. He said, do a bit of research. So I sent him an email, CV on it. CV looked really good. Um, I thought, I'd better do some research. Ten minutes later, I got this phone call, unexpected. Uh, Is that Jim? Yeah. Oh, it's, it's Mike O'Connor from Vodafone. Um, Steve McCann's just sent, sent me a CV. He looks brilliant. Got a degree in computing. I said, oh, yeah, yeah. Steve's really enjoying it there. Mike says he loves working for you. I had a bit of a conversation. He said, look, Jim, I'm looking for a Unix engineer. What do you know about Unix? So we'll hand on art, Mike. I've just Googled it. There's 48 commands. How hard can it be? <laughs> and, he, <laughs> and he just started laughing. He said, that's brilliant. I weren't expecting that. Can you come down for an interview? And cut, cut a long story short, I went down for an interview. That was Tuesday. I was down there on the Thursday. And I started three weeks later, beginning of September, 2006, and it completely changed my life. Vodafone, massive company, clear mission, clear vision, clear values. All of a sudden, I got a purpose. I'd got an identity, and I'd got a new family. It was very well set up, so people genuinely looked after you there, and they cared about the customers, and it was all about being a customer-centric organization, and I loved it. When I left Mike's team 18 months later, I still knew nothing about Unix. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> uh, but I got stuff done you know in a world where people would send emails and I just went and asked people to do stuff and they did it and uh, just got stuff done and when I told Mike I'd, I'd got a job and meant a promotion he said look you were never going to be here forever this was just a stepping stone for you to get into Vodafone and Vodafone was wonderful for me I had eight very 
very happy years there. Um, eight years. Eight years. Been. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, met, I met Sally, my wife there. We've now got four kids, all girls. So I've I got two girls. All the cool, all the cool blokes have girls. Allegedly, yeah. <laughs> Played uh, touch rugby. So is it? Went up to the corporate games and won, won the touch rugby tournament in the second year of being there. It was, it was just brilliant. It, it really was a, a great environment to work and, and cut your corporate teeth on. And uh, I loved it. Did you? So you, you did the pretending to be a Unix engineer, but getting <laughs> other people to do all the work? Yeah, I was a... What, what did you do after that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was a pretend Unix engineer <laughs> with resource management. I then went into uh, release management. So okay. looking after yeah. the, the, the e-commerce portal at Vodafone. E-shop, as we call it, that was a great job. Some great colleagues there, Jim Sanders and Sarah Shaw. I worked very closely with the e-commerce team, and uh, they asked me to join them to do a special project, um, free sim project, and assimilated me into the e-commerce team from a. So I was running that from an operational perspective, and then I looked after the whole of channel management fulfillment. So channel agnostic, making sure everyone got the, the mobile phones. That had ordered them, so whether that's online telesales, yeah, and or indirects, and it was quite a challenging job. Was loving it, a big team at that point, a lot of direct reports, a lot of responsibility. But because of my background as an engineer, everything was really logical. I found it easy, and the people side of things even better. So, yeah, flourished in that environment. Really enjoyed it. Didn't think I'd move. Really settled. Live in Newbury, and then I got a call from. Um, a colleague of mine who had gone up to Sky, and he was the e-commerce director at Sky, and he said, "He said, oh, there's a brilliant job here for you, Jim." I said, "Look, Gary, a really good mate. I said, I don't think it'd be a good idea me and you working together because we were good." And he said, "Oh, it's not working for me. It's working for a guy called Keith Martin." I said, "All right, brilliant. Yeah, well, send me the job spec." So he sent me it, and I sent my CV, and then the recruiter rang me. He said, "Can you come up and have an interview?" Didn't do any prep because I didn't want to leave Vodafone. And I guess in this room is Keith Martin. He started asking me questions. I didn't prep, so I, I'm like winging it. I'm not doing, don't, doing, shining a great light on myself. And Keith was talking. I thought, I really like this guy. He's really good. And uh, interview finished. I got in the car, dri driving down the M4. And the recruiter rang me. He said, Hey, Lewis. He said, how do you think that went, Jim? I said, I'll be honest with you, mate. I didn't do any prep. I said, but Keith, he was brilliant. I said, I could, a lot of respect for the guy. I would love to work for him. Really liked him. And he said, fortunately for you, Keith feels the same way. Can you come back next week, prep, <laughs> and see how you get on? Long story short, came back the week after, really prepped. Got the job and left Vodafone. I had two and a half years at Sky, I was at, and the role was head of quality and compliance. That's sales quality and sales compliance. I then took the head of sales job, and then was made redundant. Two and a half years later, it's one of those places where the cyclical redundancies. Yeah. And then uh, one of my old bosses from Vodafone gave me a call, a guy called Martin Jones, and said, um, "There's a great job at going at Stansted Airport, head of commercial. You haven't got big numbers run on your CV. It looked great on your CV." And he was right. And I thought, you know, I'm going to throw my hat in the ring for that. Fancy it. And fortunately, I was lucky enough to get it. Yeah, I had two and a half years at Stansted Airport, which is a long way from home, but I lived up at the airport, enjoyed it. Quite a challenging environment. The, the year one was very steep learning curve. I was looking after the entire car parking operation and things went ever so slightly awry from time to time. People would turn up to meet and greet and you either couldn't find the car or the keys or both. So it was a great opportunity to put some systems and processes in place yeah. to get that right. And uh, yeah, it was great. It was a great learning experience. And it was an industry that was growing and growing and growing, the aviation industry. And then all of a sudden, bang, COVID hit. And we went from moving at 100,000 passengers a day to 12. I don't mean 12,000, 12 passengers. Overnight, the plane stopped flying. Yeah. So I was very, very quickly furloughed. <laughs> yeah and that was wonderful Nick absolutely brilliant I don't know if you remember the, the weather during Covid it was idyllic so I was at home spending time with people I love Sally and the kids a lot of time on my hands and 
out with the dogs, Vic and Bob. And uh, yeah, it was brilliant. Loved it. I loved, I loved the furlough time. And it just gave me a little bit of time to reflect on my life and, and sort of plan the next steps. Did you ever go back to that job? No, there was a bit of a, obviously, six month period. It, nobody knew what was going to happen. The avi indust aviation industry was in disarray. And um, they offered redundancy. I took a redundancy package. I'd already made some decisions at that point, what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And um, yeah, it was, a, it was a good springboard, really, into what we're doing now at Karma. You've left and you, you, you've you dabbled running your own gig and found yourself a little bit wanting. And then you've blagged into a corporate career. Mm -hmm. It seems to have then gone really well and you've had some really, really strong, impressive roles. Why then make the decision of actually I'm not going to keep doing something that I've proven over the last number of years that I'm really good at and and roll the dice again going into or or do you think that it was because you'd you'd learnt, you'd now learned enough lessons that you thought you could have another crack yeah we never day as a school day and we'll, we'll never stop making mistakes but I was a lot more confident and rounded at 50 than I was when I was 30 shall yeah. we say, a lot of water passed under the bridge. Over the furlough time, I got together with some old Royal Navy Rugby League teammates and um, tragically, 12 years ago, we lost a, a teammate to suicide on his transition journey, two months in, and that really impacted us as a team. We all went up to his funeral in Wigan, a guy called Nigel Burkett, who's a great friend. He was on the four-year course with me. So I'd spent an inordinate amount of time with him. Yeah. Thought the world of him. Played a lot of rugby together. We all went to the funeral, but we didn't do anything above and beyond that because life gets in the way of, of doing the right thing. Yeah. And we'd got this, all this time on our hands in furlough. So we started talking, myself, a guy called Neil Gay, Izzy to his friends, <laughs> and uh, Andy Steele. <laughs> Who's the uh, and we start saying look we, we want to do something let let's let's get together and form a charity so we cast the net a bit wider we got a guy called Jason Steele Wayne O'Kell Adrian Baxter involved and start having conversations shall we and so we, we formed a charity called In Touch Royal Navy Rugby League and In Touch is built on three pillars reset reconnect and relive resets all about helping ex or maybe rugby league players on that transition. So what happened to Nige can't happen again. Um, reconnect, reaching out and talking to your old oppos. And relive, which is getting together once or twice a year, having a few beers and a Pulling meal. Pulling up the sandbag. Pulling up a sandbag, <laughs> yeah. And remembering how good or bad you were 25 years ago. Yeah. We've had two of those events today down in Portsmouth. And, and the last one, Bobby Davro turned, turned up and, and did a turn. It was absolutely amazing. It, it's just great. And it's, it's opened up so many doors for us um, that we thought were closed. We've been able to help four people out. We've, we've raised some decent money for the charity. And we start playing Masters Rugby League, which is interesting. And yeah, it's brilliant. It's been a really good thing to do and a, a really worthwhile exercise and just nice to be involved in it. And it's through that process that reconnecting, that I've reconnected with Dr. Andrew Steele. And Andy Steele, when he left the Navy 18 years ago, he moved out to Bangkok and started the Plant a Tree Today Foundation. And over that time, he's planted three and a half million trees on three different continents. Wow. And I'm talking to him, he's got one of these blurred out Zoom screens behind him. So I said, so you're still in Bangkok? He said, oh no, I've, I've moved from Bangkok back to Hull. And you've moved from Bangkok to Hull, Andy? He said, why would you do that? He said, they only invented Hull to make Barnsley look like Las Vegas. And he was giggling. He said, well, I, I'm from Hull, I had to come home sometime. I said, so what are you doing? He said, well, I'm still planting trees. He said, I'm working with our forces resettlement. He said, and I've started a company called the Green Task Force. He said, and you won't know this, Jim. He said, but 10% of service leavers struggled, struggled to find employment, depending where they are regionally. And he said, and of the ones who do find employment, within two years, a further 15% need a hand up. It's not a hand out. He said, a hand up. So why do you think I, I wouldn't know that? 
He said, well, you've done all right. I said, mate, I really struggled. I really struggled to resell. He said, oh, well, he said, didn't realise. He said, so the Green Task Force, it's made up of veterans and service leavers, and we pro provide them with positive pathways to employment through nature-based tasks, tree planting, fencing, fighting invasive species, Japanese knotweed, Himalayan balsam, bracken clearing. He said, then uh, some of the guys and girls have got PTSD, and we treat them through nature-based therapy. He said, everyone in the Green Task Force gets a vocational qualification in horticulture. And then we work with recruitment companies to get them back on the employment ladder once they've got an emotional and a physical backstop. I'm like, mate, that is epic. I said, how do I get involved? And he looked at me and he said, well, you can't plant trees, Lofty. I was there when you got injured. And I'm like, well, I'm not talking about planting trees. I said, Andy, how can I help you? He said, well, we need more trees to plant. I went, right. So I went away and, and fo started formulating a business idea because you've got two wonderful things there, social and environmental impact. And I thought that this, this could be a winner, which is when the concept of making social and environmental impact simple and affordable through a digital platform entered into my head. So for anyone who like, but for some reason hasn't heard of karma. Tell us, uh, t tell us what you do. So yeah, karma. <laughs> we make social environmental <laughs> impact simple and affordable. And we do that by planting trees and we plant trees in the UK, employing veterans and service leavers in the green task force. And we work with Eden reforestation projects, employing impoverished communities all around the globe. And it's, it's empirical. When you plant a tree, three wonderful things happen. One, you employ someone to do it, which helps them with their social mobility. Gives them a feeling of self-worth. They can put dinner on the table. Two, you get a net biodiversity gain. So you plant a tree, animals and creatures live in that tree. And finally, a wonderful third product is over time, it absorbs CO2. Trees are the lungs of the earth. So we, we're doing great things. We've, we've come up with an impact calculator, an impact dashboard. You can put it on your, on your website. Just simply log in and see how many trees you've planted, how many work days you've created, and how much CO2 has been absorbed as a direct impact of the action you've taken. And businesses are responding really well to it. It's year three for us now. We've built a digital platform, got investment, grown the team. And um, yeah, we're, we're pushing out into industry and, and getting some great orders. That's awesome. And how are companies engaging with you? Our core proposition is tree commerce. So <laughs> you, prov <laughs> you provide- <laughs> Trademark. <laughs> tra 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 trademark karma. So, so you, you sell your customers, Nick, a product or service, could be a laptop, it could be an hour's labor. You plant a tree from as little as 25p. And that's your way of giving back to, to people and planet and showing your customers you care. You're not just in it for the money. You want to do good as well. And so many companies want to do that to demonstrate that they're not just all about the profit. They want to show they've got real strong ESG values, um, CSR ratings, and they want to do more in that space. We do hosted tree planting days. So people can bring the teams out. It's great for team building, great for team bonding, working with veterans in the outdoors. We've planted in the snow up in Hull, but we're always a fully hosted day. We've always got a support vehicle. There's always food, there's always drinks, hot drinks. And uh, yeah, wonderful days and plant a minimum of a thousand trees. So it's, you don't get too cold. Right. Yeah. And then we've got, we've got a Shopify app where people can, plant trees every time they sell a product. We've also got um, subscriptions. So if you wanted to join Karma for as little as three ninety nine a month, the price of a half a beer these days in London, Nick, the <laughs> price of a coffee yeah. in London, you can join Karma and we plant 12 trees per month, every single month, plus two, two bonus trees planted in the UK by veterans or service leavers. Or you could opt to have a UK only package and uh, have all your trees planted in the UK. So how did you get started? 
once you when, once you started to put the idea together, how, how did you get started? We built a website that detailed the proposition, what we were selling, tree planting days, subscriptions, and we hadn't quite come up with the idea of tree commerce then. And then I went and sat in front of um, businesses, just opened my contact book. Within a month, I was sat in front of McLaren, Tim Bampton, who was working there at the time, really senior within the organization. He stopped me halfway through my pitch, said, Jim, I've got to stop you there. I'm thinking, oh, what have I said? Just replaying the conversation. And he said, look, my CSR strategy is built on four pillars, environmental, social, diversity, inclusion, and um, mental health. And I'm like, he said, you're ticking three boxes here. I said, well, we could. He said, you don't need to anymore. I said, this is brilliant. And it was, it was absolutely wonderful feedback. Starbucks were one of our first customers. For CBRE are on the books. And we're looking to provide them with part of their ESG solution moving forward. Um, Civica, Yodel, Go Cardless, planting 5,000 trees with us. And it's just becoming easier and easier to sell. We've just gone for B Corp accreditation. We're all submitted. We're just waiting for the final stamp of approval. And we've got an absolutely whopping B Corp score. So we're delighted with that. That's incredible. And is it just for companies or can individuals subscribe? In, as individuals. Well? So we, we've got, a, as a consumer, you can sign up to the platform and get trees planted on your behalf. And, and our concept is a lot of people doing their bit makes a massive difference. So we really want to get mass market in the B2C yeah. space. And we, we're predominantly working B2B2C. So people with large user bases, we want them to start through putting our product and, and getting the, the customers and, and as an employee engagement too, and rewarding their employees with the Karma subscription. Giving Karma, and it's Karma, it's Karma with a C. It's short for Carbon Karma. And the, the motto is doing good together. I like it, I like it. So like people could, people could give a tree instead of a birthday card. Exactly. That, that kind of thing. You gift Karma for Christmas. Yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. So it's quite some journey you've uh, you, you've been on through the unexpected departure from the Navy, through being a publican, being a, a, a corporate flyer, and then now you're reforesting the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to the point where I was really satisfied with what I'd done in the corporate world. I made... Um, shareholders of some big companies, lots and lots and lots of money. And I, I wanted to, to have a go on myself, leave a legacy and do something that I felt really good about. I was yeah. really vested in with purpose that, that helps people out. And you know, our North Star is social and environmental impact. And so every day we get up, that's, that's what we're trying to do, make a difference to the world and make it a better place and leave a legacy. That's incredible. So if you were... Uh... If you were to have a conversation with someone who was coming towards the end of their military career, what advice would you give them for for what to do when you leave? Well, first of all, don't stumble out the door. You can't you can't afford to do that and hope that someone's going to hit you in the face. And if, if, as soon as you start to think about leaving, start asking people who've already done it and network and network, network, network take advice, make a plan, know when you're leaving, make sure you've used all your credits, your resettlement credits, taking some advice and have some sort of semblance of a plan. Big bit of advice, I would, wouldn't go back to Barnsley if you were from there. <laughs> <laughs> the still... Apologies to the people of Barnsley. <laughs> <laughs> I love, no, the people of Barnsley are wonderful. It's just, there's not a, it's not a hive of industry. <laughs> Yeah. But um, yeah, make a plan, talk to people. There's lots of networks out there that you can plug into the Gendit network, the entrepreneurs network. And there's lots of help for, for service leavers. And but the network we met through, that's, yeah. that's an incredible group of people. Yeah, absolutely off, off the scale. Yeah. But Ben Legg's done an amazing job with veteran entrepreneurs. And yeah. you, you can't help but smile when you think of some of the eclectic characters that, that are within that group. It's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And plug into those networks, ask lots of questions, 
do a lot of research and prep yourself for going there. And it's funny, I've, I've already said it, but when you leave the forces, you lose those three things overnight. Your forces family, your purpose and your identity. And make sure whatever environment you're going into, that those are counted for. And it's interesting, through setting up In Touch, we spoke to this ex rugby league player who's now a, a, a psychiatrist um, absolutely well he's a clinical psychologist brilliant guy called John Bell and I played rugby and I'm talking to him about how he could help us out with in touch and he said uh, just quick quickly Jim he said how do you feel when you you left the Navy and I was on a zoom call with him I think I'm like, we're really ready for that question John and I sort of stumbled my way and he said look I'm, I'm just going to help you out he said when I stopped playing rugby league I couldn't go to the grounds I used to play at. I couldn't see the people that I used to train with day in, day out. I didn't even really like looking at the scores on, on the telly or in the newspaper, he said, because I just couldn't get over the fact that it continued without me. And I sat there and I thought, wow, I wish somebody had said that to me 20 years ago when I left the Navy. That I really it took a while to make peace with that. It had been a part of something so massive, which was yeah. a huge part of my life. And then it, and it I, wasn't your choice to leave. It wasn't either, my choice. Is, yeah, and, that's tough. And it kept going. And all the things I used to do kept going. And I wasn't part of it. And that's tough. And if, if you can make peace with that really early on and fill that gap, you're going to have a huge vacuum in your life. So whatever you can do to fill that with real purpose, give yourself a new identity that when you get out of bed in the morning, you're going to be that person and do that thing. That's awesome. Jim, thank you so much for your time today. It's been really great talking to you. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Nick. Um, I hope I lived up to expectations. <laughs> I've cracked a few smiles. <laughs> it's been brilliant. Thanks, mate. So if you do want to find out more about Car Karma, Nick, um, just go online, karma.earth. That's C-A-R-M-A dot earth. And there's loads of things on there. You could sign up for as little as $3.99. And uh, yeah, make a difference. Doing good together. <laughs>